Welcome to Soul Forum. Each episode invites you to journey across the landscape of our global collective soul. From the moment humankind entered into the story of the universe, we have sought to orient ourselves within this unfolding gift of life. Together, we continue to seek insights and language to navigate our experience of spirituality, ethics, sexuality and gender roles, civic engagement, our role in the ecosphere, and more. Your guide for each of our series are emerging scholars from around the world studying at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. The GTU is one of the world's most comprehensive centers for graduate study of religion and theology. It's a leading destination for leaders and innovators from a wide range of spiritual and philosophical perspectives to explore the world's great religions and wisdom traditions. So, so give yourself a moment to lean in and journey a little deeper into the human experience. Welcome to Soul Forum. I'm Dan Center, and I'm the curator of this uh, podcast. Uh, delighted to introduce you today to Victoria Price for part two um, a series on how how we as spiritual people or people in religious organizations are um, having to navigate our way through a kind of a digital spirituality that most of our experiences with religion these days are online in some sort of online format. In our last episode, Victoria looked at the history of that uh, experience of being digital, and today she will explore kind of what that means for us as we engage in the global pandemic that has us all scrambling for new ways to interact with each other and explore our spirituality. I've been doing this kind of work for most of my adult life, uh, navigating spiritual communities, helping them to be both critical about their traditions and creative about the ways in which they give expression. I'm delighted that you're here as you continue to explore uh, what your own soul's journey might look like today. Victoria Price is a second-year PhD student in Hindu studies at the Graduate Theological Union. Uh, She does look at the global impact on Hindu communities in the United States and focuses on digital communication and technologies. So without further ado, part two of Victoria Price's exploration of digital spirituality. Welcome back to those who joined us last week, and for those who are just joining us for the first time, I'm very glad that you're here. As we saw last week, the practices of distance ministry and televangelism haven't gone anywhere since they debuted in the early 20th century. In some sense, I believe the presence of televangelists on the radio, television, and now social media platforms may have made it easier for people of different faiths to adjust to online religious services once shelter-in-place orders were issued. On this week's episode, we'll discuss the specific ways that COVID-19 has changed how people around the world practice their religion. We'll look at the major religious traditions of Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, and see how they were functioning before COVID hit, and chronicle some of the most impactful changes that have happened since the beginning of the year. So to get us started, let's just rewind a bit back to the beginning of the year. The first case of COVID in the U.S. was confirmed on January 20th. After that, the World Health Organization, the WHO, declared a global health emergency on January 31st, and the U.S. declared a public health emergency shortly thereafter on February 3rd. On March 11th, the WHO officially declared COVID-19 a pandemic, which again prompted the Trump administration to make an announcement. This time, on March 13th, President Trump declared COVID-19 a national emergency. After the national emergency declaration, things very quickly went from wash your hands and wear a mask to shut the buildings for the foreseeable future in a lot of places, including businesses, schools, and some houses of worship. But the response by state leaders, specifically with regard to whether or not to allow religious communities to gather, was a pretty mixed bag. 
In mid-March, um, thing, there were still a lot of parts of the U.S. that were encouraging folks to keep coming to in-person services despite the CDC recommendations. Some states initially told churches and other religious centers to close their doors and then walked those restrictions back shortly after. For instance, Florida originally had in-person church services shut down, but on March 30th, a pastor at a megachurch in Florida had an arrest warrant issued for him because he continued to hold services despite the stay-at-home order. Following backlash from the community because of that arrest warrant, in April, around the time of Easter, Governor DeSantis of Florida said that he didn't think the government had the authority to close churches. Following that statement from Governor DeSantis, the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, went so far as to declare in-person religious services as essential. So that's obviously on the extreme end of the decision-making about religious services. But while these religious services weren't deemed essential by most state leaders, by the end of April, emergency declarations and stay-at-home orders in 40 states made exceptions for religious services. By mid-April, many houses of worship had already made the decision to close their doors to physical gatherings, even if their state leaders had exempted them from legal punishment. From mid-April, we saw a short decline in the number of COVID cases in the U.S., and obviously things now have continually gotten worse. As I record this, we've just recently passed 200,000 Americans dead from COVID-19. So unfortunately, it looks like we're going to be having online services for the foreseeable future. But throughout the pandemic, as we've experienced it so far... We've seen a lot of jarring religious imagery. Early responses to the pandemic mainly included just shutting things down. Places of worship were told to close their doors for the most part. Pilgrimage sites around the world stopped taking visitors because international travel was banned in many countries. And so, a lot of places where we're used to seeing hundreds or thousands of people, sometimes millions of people gathering for celebration or prayer or worship of any kind, um, suddenly these places were just empty. You might recall Pope Francis's prayer for the health and safety of the world uh, at the end of March. He spoke into St. Peter's Square, which normally holds 300,000 people, and his only physical audience for this particular prayer was the broadcasting equipment that his team had put up for him. The square was completely empty of people, um, but the service was viewed online by more than 11 million individuals. But still, the photos that came out of that event were absolutely jarring. Another image that I personally haven't been able to get out of my head, and I'm sure many of you have seen it as well, is a completely empty Kaaba in Saudi Arabia. As many of you probably know, the Kaaba is the holiest site for Muslims. One of the five pillars of Islam, one of their key tenets, is that all Muslims who are financially and physically able to do so are required to make the pilgrimage to Mecca and complete a week-long ritual process there. I'll say more about how the annual pilgrimage was impacted this year later on, but the first images that came out of the completely empty holy city were astounding. And that's what we've continued to see, not just in religious institutions, but all over. I'm sure all of you have seen photos of downtown San Francisco with completely empty streets. And it's disorienting to see places that are normally so densely populated just empty almost overnight in some cases. But apart from major holidays and other large gatherings, regular day-to-day practices have had to be modified to comply with new social distancing guidelines. Overall, the Christian response has been pretty mixed throughout the U.S. By mid-March, the information we had about COVID and how it spread, how to protect ourselves, and so on, 
was still unfolding. Um, even now in September, we're still learning new things about it all the time. But in the spring, it was still unclear whether everyone needed to wear masks uh, and, and what sort of precautions we needed to take to help stop the spread of the virus. So some churches continued having in-person services while others didn't. Some churches were already using social media and other online platforms in their ministry, so they just ramped up their online presence and scaled back their face-to-face practices. If you listened to last week's episode, then you'll remember that a lot of evangelicals had already embraced the use of social media specifically for spreading their message, and millions of people globally were already tuning in to weekly television or online services held by people like Joel Osteen. So that was already a regular occurrence. It just had to be shifted to the norm once COVID hit. But some responses within Christianity have not been so in line with public safety regulations. Specifically, the Eastern Orthodox tradition has largely, if not completely, ignored the recommendations that others have been following to limit the spread of the virus. This is something that, admittedly, I just learned in the past week, but in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, Communion is given to the entire congregation from a single chalice, and they use a single serving spoon to serve the blood of Christ to everyone in attendance. So even before COVID, this would have been very questionable to outsiders, um, but now the sudden heightened concern over public health and the spread of the disease has made this seem even more concerning to those outside the tradition, and it's gotten a little bit of press Um, globally. In Australia, congregants of the Eastern Orthodox tradition were told by the Archdiocese of Australia that the Holy Cub cannot carry disease. Um, That's a direct quote from them. So back in March, they were adamant that they were going to continue their practices with this communal serving spoon. Um, And since then, in the Eastern Orthodox congregations around the world, church leaders have continued to hold this kind of practice and ignore all of the recommendations of the WHO and the CDC. They have still been packing people into churches, in most cases not wearing masks, no sort of social distancing measures in place, and still, again, using this one spoon um, for everyone. But of course, that's on the extreme end, way on the extreme end, Um, And leaders of other branches of Christianity have been a lot more mindful of public health recommendations and have been more open to moving online. But the majority of congregations in the U.S. have embraced at least some form of online worship. Others have have used, um, we've seen practices where people gather in the parking lot, almost like a drive-in movie theater, with the preacher at the front and everyone parked um, in rows in the parking lot listening to the service from their car. Um, But a lot of churches have moved things more online, giving um, online sermons every week, posting prayer reflections, um, some churches have, have had their their musical accompaniments online. Um, so there's there's been a mixed reaction, but mostly positive from Christians in the U.S. But moving on to other religious traditions, at the v- very beginning of national shutdowns in the U.S., Jews were among the first to test how holidays could be transitioned from in-person to online. A major holiday in Judaism, Passover, was celebrated from April 8th to April 16th this year, shortly after shelter-in-place orders were issued in many parts of the country. Um, As far as I know, there were only a handful of websites dedicated to virtual Jewish services before COVID. One of the most important parts of Shabbat, which is the Jewish Sabbath, in fact, is to literally unplug from electronics and technology. The Sabbath for Jews is meant to be a day where no work happens and everyone rests in order to honor the day. 
And that idea goes into major holidays as well. So Passover specifically is a time of reflection and gathering of the community. It marks the exodus of the Jews from Egyptian slavery when God passed over the houses of the Israelites during the last of the ten plagues. Traditionally, on the first night of Passover, families and friends gather together for what's called the Seder meal to tell the story of the exodus. But this year, of course, plans needed to change very rapidly. The preparation for Passover and the Seder is normally super involved. It's a big meal and the ritual that's done before the celebration requires very specific components. Some families prep the food more than a week in advance to make sure they have everything they need. It's a a big deal in Judaism. But this year, even those who lived close to family and friends that they would normally celebrate with had to re-coordinate with them to figure out how to get together with them virtually. And it was a big shift for a lot of Jews because, like I said, Passover is such a big part of the Jewish calendar and it happened so quickly after shelter-in-place orders were issued that the whole thing got turned on its head a little bit. But as time has gone on, there have been more and more virtual services for weekly Shabbat. So some synagogues have sent out flyers to their congregants with guides on how to celebrate the Sabbath at home and how to maintain a regular practice while staying distanced from the synagogue. Others have embraced online technologies and started holding services on Zoom or social media. Overall, the response that I personally have seen online from uh, my Jewish friends and community members has been an embrace of CDC and WHO recommendations, um, doing everything that they can to stop the spread of the virus, even if that means that they are distanced from the community that they know and love so much. But of course, others have been affected by COVID as well. Um, In Islam, they were also affected very early on and had to rethink their their big holiday of Ramadan. So for a full month of the Islamic calendar, Muslims are supposed to be in a more reflective and prayerful mindset as they fast every day from sunrise to sunset. No food or water, absolutely nothing during the day. So this year, Ramadan went from April 23rd to May 23rd. At the start of the month this year, I saw a lot of chatter online from Muslims who were saying that Ramadan was more trying than normal this year because fasting might be easier for some when they're not at home all day and have other things to distract them from their thirst and hunger. But this year, some people lost their jobs or were placed on leaves of absence um, and were forced to be inside their houses with the, the full pantry in their view all day. And so the fasting was more difficult, but when sundown came and they were able to break their fast, another special practice of Ramadan needed to be modified. A really nice part of the month for many Muslims is gathering with friends or family for special meals to celebrate the breaking of the fast. These these meals at the end of day at sunset are called iftar. So at the beginning of Ramadan, there was a lot of talk on social media from Muslims urging their sisters and brothers to hold on to that tradition, even if they couldn't physically gather. So by the end of the month, it had become more of a regular practice to have these virtual dinner parties to break the fast with friends and family. Something else that also needed to be reworked in Islam because of COVID was the Hajj. If you don't know, the Hajj, the annual pilgrimage by Muslims to their most holy sites in Mecca and Medina, was scheduled for late July and early August. In past years, as many as 2 million Muslims have made the pilgrimage, but this year, the, they limited it to only people younger than 65 who lived in Saudi Arabia and didn't have chronic illnesses. They enforced the use of facial coverings and social distancing by keeping pilgrims two meters apart, 
and additionally, pilgrims were not allowed to kiss or touch the Kaaba. For those who travel to the site during any pilgrimage throughout the year, touching the Kaaba is one of the most important parts of their pilgrimage. Part of the ritual of the Hajj is circling the Kaaba. Normally, when there are millions of people there, the crowd sort of ebbs and flows so that people are sort of circulated throughout the crowd. Um, The Kaaba is at the center of this cyclone of people, and the crowd gives way so people on the outside make their way toward the Kaaba as people from the inside make their way out. If you've never seen footage of this part of the ritual, you really should take a look at it because it's absolutely stunning to see these thousands of people almost overtaken by their faith in that way. But like I said before, in this year's Hajj, that practice was completely nixed. It was taken out of the plan. The pilgrims who gathered were still allowed to circle the Kaaba, but were not allowed to touch it in any way and were required to keep their distance from other um, other pilgrims. So the pilgrimage was canceled for most Muslims, but for those who were allowed to go, the experience was heavily modified. When it comes to more regular practices like Friday prayer, things started to change pretty slowly at first in the U.S. when national emergency was declared. Um, For those who don't know, Friday prayer for Muslims is akin to the Jewish Shabbat and also to um, Sunday church services in Christianity. So in March, um, some Muslim leaders issued what are called fatwa, or religious rulings. These included things like fact sheets about what the Quran says about epidemics and so on. Um, So it was their initial reaction to say, what does our holy text and our religion say about issues like this? Shortly after um, that, there was some backlash against the Islamic Society of North America because they put out a statement on how to conduct Friday prayer. Their initial statement was that healthy-bodied men should continue to attend unless there was a health threat in their immediate circle or there was a state of emergency declared. The response by the community overall was not positive uh, because the language was unacceptably gendered. Friday prayer is just as important for non-male Muslims as it is for males, Um, so people were a little upset about that. And also, they were confused because people live in family units, so even if one person comes to prayer, they still risk spreading that virus both in their home and in the community. Um, We knew, I think, at that time that Um, people could be asymptomatic and still spread the virus, so it was still a a big risk to gather in any way. So in March, early April, around then, um, some mosques were staying open even with limited congregants, um, while others very early on asked followers to pray at home for their Friday prayers. Overall, though, since about mid-April, the consensus among Muslims in the U.S. has been that mosques should stay closed as long as there is still a public health concern. So as time has gone on, more and more mosques have started broadcasting not just Friday prayers, um, but other lectures and teachings about the Quran and Islam from their websites, YouTube channels, and social media just like we've seen in Christian and Jewish communities. So moving on to Hindu responses, there's one thing that has made um, these responses different than Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And that is that India has the largest diaspora population of any nation in the world. So among immigrant populations, not just in the U.S., but everywhere, The largest percentage of those immigrants in total are of Indian origin. And while not all Indians are Hindus, the vast majority are. So Indian immigrants have been practicing virtual or distance worship services for quite a while. 
Um, depending on where a person lives, especially in the U.S., they may not have access to a temple in their specific Hindu lineage or tradition. Because of that, websites devoted to online Hindu worship have been around for over a decade. In the last five or so years, they've become more high-tech and more popular as worship sites were equipped with high-tech um, quality cameras and priests could be available for one-on-one -on -one video chats to give blessings or prayers or, or counsel to those who wanted it. So with that in mind, the overall response by Hindus in the U.S. has May basically been to maintain business as usual. Um, it's incredibly common for Hindus to have um, a, an entire room of their house dedicated to to worship um, and they have um, generally altars set up in their house for worship and prayer at home. Um, so even if someone regularly attended a temple in their community, it was very easy for them to transition to a strictly at-home practice um, that either included the use of virtual communication technologies or online services or, or not. But in India, the response has been a little different. Um, we know now India has been up in the ranks with the U.S. as far as the number of COVID cases and deaths go. The Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, mandated a nationwide shutdown in March that gave the public only four hours to prepare, and businesses and temples were shut down immediately. Until the beginning of June, worship sites weren't allowed to take visitors at all. Uh, but on June 8th, the Prime Minister started the first phase of India's reopening plan and started allowing temples to operate again with mandatory use of face masks, hand sanitizer, and social distancing. But Hindu rituals, by and large, involve a lot of sensorial experiences. Practitioners touch the statues of the deities, they smell the incense, they pour water, milk, and honey onto their idols, and in some instances they kiss the idols or prostrate at the feet of the statue. Social distancing and public health guidelines have drawn these practices way back. Um, however, as I said, it's commonplace for Hindus to have altars with personal mortis or figurines or statues of the deities, photos of their guru, um, and so on in their homes already. So moving on to a more distance practice has, while it's not been ideal for most devotees, it has been manageable. Buddhist responses to COVID have been interesting because a big part of the practice that many Buddhists already employ involves looking inward and embracing quiet and aloneness. In the U.S., Buddhist temples have basically kept their doors shut for the time being. In May, the Dalai Lama was interviewed for Time magazine and said, quote, the outbreak of this terrible coronavirus has shown that what happens to one person can soon affect every other being. But it also reminds us that a compassionate or constructive act, whether working in hospitals or just observing social distancing, has the potential to help many." Unquote. A large portion of Buddhist practice and training and meditation was already being done at home for most practitioners. So the closure of temples globally hasn't had a major impact on Buddhists around the world. So overall, across religious traditions, there are a few practices that have gained popularity since the beginning of COVID. The first is guided meditation. Popular at-home workout subscriptions such as Beachbody have added collections of meditations to their libraries of weightlifting, cardio, and yoga practices. Speaking of yoga, there's also been an uptick in viewership of guided yoga videos on YouTube and these other sorts of platforms. There's also been a wave of sound bath videos. If you don't know, um, a sound bath is a sonic meditative practice where participants are enveloped in a sea of sound. 
I've seen these popping up on Instagram, TikTok, um, in, in YouTube, and other websites as well. The last point I want to make in this episode is that while there's been a lot of positivity coming out of embracing online religion, there have also been some not-so-great outcomes. Some televangelists have taken the seed faith model of Oral Roberts way to the extreme. Some ministers have had lawsuits taken out against them for selling water and oil and other things that they claim have been blessed and have the ability to cure COVID. Obviously, their claims are false. The things that they're selling have no ability to cure the virus, and in some instances, they may even be harmful if ingested by humans. Um, So that has been taking religion to the point of um, manipulation, and it's been really disheartening to see for me. Additionally, as religious centers have stayed closed, it's come to light that these centers really play a larger role in their communities outside of their religious context. Many houses of worship, especially in more urban areas, provide different services for their communities. These services include things like childcare, education, and providing meals for those who need them. Leaders of these worship spaces have had to get really creative in order to continue serving the more at-risk or or disadvantaged members of their communities. But like I said last week and earlier in this episode, unfortunately, it doesn't look like in-person services will be returning anytime soon. And when they do, things will probably be a little different than what we remember. So for now, thank you for listening. Don't forget to tune in again next week for the last episode in this series. We'll be talking about how online religion and digital communication technologies have the potential to change the way that differently abled and disadvantaged communities express their faith and interact with their chosen religious communities. I'm Victoria Price, signing out again until next time. Take care, and thanks for listening. Thank you for being part of Soul Forum today. We appreciate you tuning in and listening. Each episode allows you a chance to reach out to the speaker with one of your questions or insights, and I invite you to do that by just simply sending an email to soulforum at oslc.net, and we'll gather together some of the questions or insights and put together a small panel to have a live Zoom Q&A with each of our speakers throughout the series. My hope is that as you've listened to this podcast, that it can help you navigate your own soul's journey as all of us are, um, in a sense, given the opportunity really to engage our life experience, not just through our mind and our bodies, but also through the way in which we express spirit in the world. So thanks for being a part of this journey into our common life and into the ways we give expression to our own souls in this day and age. See you next week.